uh, Gotabi Rajapaksa's term. So the question really for you, um, <clears throat> Iran, is will this president pull Sri Lanka out of this economic mess that we are in? Uh, interesting question. Uh, I gave up actually believing in an individual uh, and thinking that uh, one individual can pull us out of a mess. Uh, I right. think Sri Lankans have to get out of this uh, kind of thinking yeah. uh, because when they go to the polls for a presidential election, they always think that you know, if we put somebody X or Y, they'll pull the country out of the mess, we'll be okay, and so forth and so mm. on. Our experience of the last 40 years has shown us that uh, one person can't do this. You see, one person can't do this, whether it was past, present, or future. And that is why I think that uh, you need a whole team of people to actually look at the problem. The world is very complex. Issues are, problems are complex. Solutions are complex and try to oversimplify them, like thinking that, you know, you don't have a gas queue or a petrol queue now and Sri Lanka must be on its way up. It's absolute rubbish and nonsense. The problems are much deeper. It is absolute nonsense and rubbish, isn't it? But can you explain why it's yes. nonsense and rubbish to the wider public? Yeah, because uh, the, the, the present immediate crisis is that we don't have foreign currency. So we don't have dollars. We are bankrupt. We are not able to basically pay. Uh, in the last uh, couple of years, they just ran through all the balances mm. that were in foreign currency. The second problem is, uh, it is a rupees mm. and cents problem. It's the budget and the budget deficit. Incomes and expenditures, always expenditures have been more than income in 75 yeah. years. And only in five years did you have a primary balance. So that issue needs to be resolved as well. But even more fundamental in, in my own mind, that even the economic issue yeah. is, you know, you have to have a certain framework and you need to have a certain legal framework. Mm. You see, Sri Lanka on the ease of doing business index is 99. Yeah. But on the, uh, on the enforcement of uh, contracts, right, it is 164. 164. So why I just quoted those two statistics is just to show you that uh, people don't have confidence in the country. It doesn't have confidence in the legal system. It doesn't have confidence that, you know, we will actually enforce these contracts, etc. So, so the primary issues are economic, yes, but even more important than economic is, uh, you know, a rule of mm. law, right? The legal system, mm. you know, the justice system working, uh, confidence being built, democracy being upheld. These fundamentals are absolutely important and all Sri Lankans feeling that they are equal citizens in the country. I, I would say, if you fix those fundamental issues, the economy can be fixed. So if you're asking mm. me the question, can a president or this president do it? Uh, I have my doubts because it will uh, need very bold steps and it will need a government and a parliament which backs the president. This uh, uh, government and this parliament is not legitimate. Mm. It's saying not legal, but not legitimate. So therefore, I, I think it's going to be really an So task. basically, the answer to my question, will this, can this president pull us out of this economic mess? Your answer is an unequivocal no. Yes, because I think that it takes more than the president, more than an individual. There has to be a sense of legitimacy. And uh, uh, this president, this parliament, this government doesn't have the legitimacy. The only way to restore legitimacy is actually you have to hold elections, right, mm. in which people elect people who they think they can put their confidence, and then that's the framework that can actually back us out. So this is a bit of patchwork that's going on at the moment. And Aaron, can I ask you, isn't it always a good idea to separate uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy? Uh, I think it's a good idea because... Uh, uh, partially, the, the, the crisis we are faced, and particularly locally, yeah. has been that we have gone and appointed unsuitable people to high offices. Yeah. Not just in parliament, in cabinet, but even, Everywhere. E even in the administration and the central bank. Right? Yeah. And so we had a governor appointed there. I can't imagine appointing a governor who doesn't have an economics background. It's, it's, I think it's a, it's a little strange. It's like, uh, you know, pointing me as the, you know, 
head of the medical system and you know, I have absolutely no idea of medicine or being a doctor. So a similar thing. And then they went off with all kinds of theories, right? And, uh, uh, you know, the revenue of the country collapsed, the inflation went through the roof. Central bank has two primary responsibilities. One primary responsibility it has is keeping inflation down, right? And they did the complete opposite by printing money, put inflation at near 100, of the inflation at 70. It's coming down now, but I'm just saying what actually yeah. happened. And then the second responsibility is keeping the financial system stability, you know, it's a second responsibility. And there is some controversy whether they have economic responsibility as well, but for sure, the first two responsibilities are the central banks, and, and they have absolutely failed in it. But Aaron, how on earth do you grow an economy when interest rates are so high and there are various um, import controls on raw material? I mean, Sri Lanka is really basically uh, an agro-based uh, uh, raw material provider, if you like. Everything else we need to import. Now, so this is like a catch-22 situation. We have no dollars to pay. Therefore, you stop them bringing it in. Therefore, uh, corporates, um, you know, the whole economy is down. I think we, the latest figures said uh, showed that it was down by nearly 12%. So, so the economy is contracted. Then the IMF say, oh, by the way, you need to get your revenues up. You need to get collect more taxes and so on and so forth. Well, how on earth do you do that when interest rates are so high, restrictions on imports, and you are constraining corporates from going out and doing their work? And therefore, they will pay less taxes. The customs, the automobile industry, is so it's not even heard of anymore. There's no imports of anything. You know, I, I can't get a spare part for the car. And uh, the people in Panchikawa can't fix it. You know, so um, how, do you, how do you grow this economy? How do you get your revenues up with these constraints, especially the interest rate? Uh, you're absolutely right in that there are lots of constraints at the moment. So this is was a question of actually priority. So the priority uh, was to bring inflation down. And to bring inflation down, uh, uh, you needed to basically put interest rates up. And uh, so interest rates went sky high and uh, inflation has come down. And when interest rates go sky high, what happens is demand in the economy begins to shrink. So that's a negative side. Plus side, inflation is coming down. Negative side is the economy has shrunk. In fact, I was really surprised at the end of the second quarter, yeah. the economy had shrunk 11%, 11% minus. You see, that's it. So what does that mean? That means that industries have scaled down, uh, people have been laid off, unemployment has a real reason, uh, your, your production is low, your exports are you know, uh, being challenged, and, and clearly it's a contractionary phase. So we are in the contractionary phase. Now, the, really, how do you turn it around? Mm. So with low inflation, uh, uh, you'll have low interest rates. Yeah. And when interest rates come down, uh, then there will be a greater demand for credit. You know, that certainly will help. But as you know, for us, in any business, whether it's a country yeah. or any business, you need both capital of and course. debt, yeah. you see. And so Apple Sri Lanka has to attract the capital. And that's an issue of how many people have confidence in the country, right? And they think the country is acceptable to actually come and invest here. I mean, uh, I don't want to comment specifically, but I, I might as well, I suppose. For example, if we took the investor who came from Oman, and had a business here. And he was forever and a day being interfered with by the local politicians. And uh, I suppose it was his fault for entertaining them, uh, but it grew, the interference grew. So much so that those people were, were almost able to hire and fire people as and when they felt like it or their political needs felt like it. And, and now this man will probably go back He'll forget his investment here. But, and I doubt if any other uh, investor will then come back. So you're back to this whole business about the ease, ease of doing business and the implementation part of it. So how, how, where's the balance? Where do we find this balance and how quickly can we find this balance? Yeah, so this is uh, one area in which uh, I think the, the, the incumbent president needs to give leadership 
because this is really to build confidence in the system. You refer to that Omani businessman and the story is well known, it's been all over in the media. It's totally unacceptable. What we don't realize is that these incidents really remain in the consciousness of the business community. More recently... All right. uh, sorry, Iran, let, let's go for a quick break and uh, take a peek in this evening's headline news. And we'll be right back. We are in conversation with Iran Vikramaran. News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukat Ali on TV1. You can't bring everything under the freedom of expression. There has to be a limit. President's message to the West. Private members' bill by MP Katagoda to empower the minister in charge on deciding tenures of LG bodies requires a referendum, says the Attorney General. Suspicion on the death of a young woman at the Pera Denia Teaching Hospital. Venerable Rajangane Sadharatanathera granted bail. Sri Lanka win two bronze medals at the 25th Asian Athletic Championship. When a heart attack strikes, every minute makes the difference between life and death. With the right care and treatment at the hand of the most skilled surgeons and medical professionals, with the perfect environment for recovery, Darden's Heart Center, dedicated to you. News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukat Ali on TV One. And, uh, welcome back to Newsline Zoom. I'm in conversation with the SJB Member of Parliament, Mr. Eran Vikramaratna, former cricketer, former banker, and now trying to fix, tell us and everybody else on how to fix this economy. Tell me, Eran, come on. How do you grow this economy? How do you get revenues going up? How do you increase employment? when the economy has contracted. Kind of the stories I'm saying, sometimes people don't realize the importance of it, right? And uh, we were oh. talking about the Romani businessman. Then there's a more recently, I got a call suddenly in the night saying that in the business uh, town in Navam Mavata, a building yeah. had been occupied by some people mm. and uh, they had called in the police, but till early morning, the people were not evacuated. People had gone in by force, occupied, you know, various uh, consular office and various other officers yeah. as well. Now, the people don't realize that when such things happen in the business district, the impact that's going to be there in the minds of mm. businessmen. You see, from even the th thing about in the past, you know, I, I mentioned that earlier, that the, you know, businessmen being killed in broad daylight and still the verdict is not out. In, 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 in the city of Colombo, that's a yeah, finished chapter right. incident. And so, so these things, and then several years ago in the last parliament, right, they basically took over uh, private businesses, assets were taken back by the government by just a parliamentary mm. move. Now, all these kinds of things, right, really affect Sri Lanka in terms of business and the business uh, 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 prospect. So that is why I keep saying that this is an area in which the president can take some leadership. Rule of law has to be applied. If you don't apply the rule of law, I mean, a lot of these things, even in the case of the Omani businessman, there hardly anything was done. And if something was done subsequently, it was done too late. So that is the first principle. Bring, bring the countries down, show there's rule of law, that the rule will be applied irrespective of who it is. People have confidence. They know they can come and contract in this country. Their contracts will be up here. So that will be one. We have focused often on things like what's the tax rate? You know, should we reduce tax rate, you know, and, and attract them that way? But this is more fundamental, more fundamental. You see that this, this is actually fixed. So now we have to move from the contraction stage to the uh, uh, expansion stage. So investment is going to be number one. Exports will have to be given priority because you have to rebalance, you know, your balance of payments and therefore exports. So government will have to think about uh, incentives for that. It will have to think about you know, how to improve your doing business index. There are so many things in it that have to be improved. BOI will have to be basically looked at, drastically restructured, you know, actually mm. to attract it. 
now we have really an opportunity because Asia is growing. India is growing very, very speedily. India is growing and we have an opportunity. So I, I would say it's all in our hands. We have bad policy. We have uh, bad management and we also have corruption, right? And until these three things are really tackled, we can't really benefit from even Asian growth. But it would be fair to say that Sri Lankans do corruption like no one else does. That's a huge issue. And you can survey any Sri Lankan. They will tell you that from top to bottom, the system is corrupt and something needs mm. to be done. Um, what about this whole business? What right do state-owned enterprises have to continuously lose money? I mean, at the Capital Maharaja Group, if we have divisions that are losing money, our chairman will be getting the whip out very, very pronto. So what right do the state-owned enterprises have to call on the Treasury to keep funding the, uh, their, their losses? Shouldn't they just be shut down? Yeah, so I, I want uh, uh, Faraz employed, unemployment benefit employed, unemployment benefits. It's a globally accepted concept. It's given for a period of time. Then you have to go looking for, the, looking for your job. You need to get employed. Otherwise, you can lose your benefits and so forth. But trying to put people to the state-owned enterprise system mm. to really solve your unemployment problem has been going on for the last 25 years, right? And this nonsense has to basically what stop. About Sri so I would say it's what about Sri Lankan thing. Airlines? Yeah, so Sri Lankan Airlines has, a, a, I would say, a loss, accumulated loss of probably close to 400 billion rupees. So that's more than a billion dollars, right? Accumulated over a period of time. Sri Lankan Airlines is a, a highly competitive business because you are competing with all the international airlines you know, around the world and in the region in particular. So it's a competitive business. And if I take the history without looking at whom to blame, over a period of time, it's been running at a huge loss. So there's a question, can we actually compete in this space without really having the wherewithal? And that means we need to put capital into this business and no Sri Lankan government has ever been able to put the necessary capital into this business. It has some subsidiary businesses like catering, ground handling and all, which are more profitable. They have an advantage because they're near monopolies in, in those areas and they are making profits. They, I'm sure can be improved in terms of efficiency. But Sri Lankan Airlines is fundamentally a loss maker. It will continue to make losses. In the past, one attempt was made at privatizing it with Emirates and then it was taken back uh, actually, finding a partner itself is going to be an issue and a problem. So if a political decision is taken, more than a financial decision, to keep Sri Lankan airlines in the air, then we certainly need to find a partner. And, and the question is going to come then out of the losses, how much of it the government will have to actually take over if it's going to actually find a partner to make it viable. Partners will probably want to take, uh, will agree to pay the debt, if the government give them the airline for one dollar, as they've done in the past in Malaysia, they've done it several times. Yeah, so I, I would say in principle, something like that will have to be looked at in principle. And, uh, and uh, it can be more than a dollar because there are subsidiaries which are profit making and different models can be looked at. Now, if you look at India, for example, uh, the, the you know, the different companies, private companies, including Tata, they've got some into airport management, some have gone in and actually bought the airlines, right? And uh, there was a news report just a couple of days ago that Indigo had ordered 550 new aircraft. Yes. So you can imagine the economic revolution that's going on, you know, in the Indian subcontinent. We can easily benefit from it, but we have to be clear. One is, right, we have to minimize corruption. That having an anti-corruption law itself is insufficient, which is what... We have just passed, but actually we have to go after the corrupt. You know, Sri Lanka has laws, but often the implementation is the issue. We have to go after the corrupt, right? And we have to show the example. If we can, if we can do that, right, the anti-corruption can be uh, tackled. Then I, I would say that uh, there is a, a, a hope, you know, that things could change, turn around. Should the government be owning Sri Lankan Airlines? Shouldn't uh, long years ago I heard this story, and I have no reason to disbelieve it. Um, uh, Mahinda Rajapaksa was the president and uh, he was trying to persuade somebody to come and be the CEO and that fellow was refusing. And you know, in this conversation, he said, look, 
why does this airline make a loss? You know, he said, if we privatize, if you put it up for sale, a certain industrialist will be the head of the queue to come and buy it. And six months later, he'll turn, up, turn it around and say, look, I'm in a profit. But if, we, if I give the same thing to the same industrialist as to be the chairman of the government-owned Sri Lankan Airlines, um, he'll continue to make losses. So uh, dear mind, I was perplexed, but I think he forgot that he had his brother-in-law as a chairman. Um, but, you know, do we need this airline? Can we afford it? Yeah, so if you look at it, and I had said this before five years ago, I said this in parliament in a short period for a few months when I, I was responsible for the airline. I, I said it that I will give it to anybody for one dollar. I said it in parliament, yeah. right? And then I said, uh, if you are purely making a private sector decision, a business decision, you will shut the airline. But if you are making a political decision, and I'm not saying political decisions are invalid, as countries do make political mm. decisions. If you make a political decision to keep the airline, then certainly you have to look at a model where you bring in an investor because this is an industry which needs an investor. Without an investor, you just can't compete. And the government's track record on running businesses is terrible in this country. If you look at it in terms of the return you know, on the investment, and, and at the end of it, the public don't benefit because if they run the business properly, we will tax and then we will take that money and we'll put it into education, into health, into social protection mm -hmm. and, and protection of the environment and so forth. So this is this is the really the story. So if we take the political decision to keep Sri Lankan Airlines, we need to have private investment in it. We need to have independent management in it. And then we, 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 we can support it. And, and, and there are ways to do it. Uh, such a report I did present to the then president at that time as well. What we shouldn't mm. do is take the, the subsidiaries of Sri Lankan Airlines, which are actually the income generators, and sell them and keep the problem. No, we should resolve the problem and then look at the subsidiaries. Tremendous scope there is, particularly with the, with the rise in Asia. Even if you look at tourism, Sri Lanka could really, really flourish, right? And we now got a second airport in Matala. Uh, at that time, uh, I was very clear that it was not the right decision because we were borrowing money and building infrastructures across the country, highways, right, mm. roads, airports, ports, etc., which was not going to give a short-term return. That's why the country is bankrupt today, because we borrowed and we are we're waiting for long-term returns, and therefore we are not able to service our debt. But now we have it. Mistakes are mistakes. They are done. Mm. We have the Matale Airport. We can even use that if we intelligently work at it as basically a tourist hub because the South has a lot to offer in terms of tourism. Mm. But to do all of that, you have to still solve some of the fundamental issues first. I'm going to finish off because uh, it's time to finish. But while you were talking about this, international partners, uh, there was once upon a time a lady called Chandrika Kumaratunga who was the president. She wanted a foreign participation in the management of Sri Lanka insurance. Well, you know, that process too was corrupt. And it was up to a Supreme Court headed by uh, um, Saraten Silva who had to dismantle that whole lot of corruption. So unfortunately, good ideas, but very poor implementation. As you told me, Sri Lanka is number 168, is it? On that implementation league. So Eram Vikramata, thank you very much. Take care. And uh, you have a great day as much as you can. And uh, as always, God bless you all.